We come to the, the second uh, keynote speech uh, for today's uh, introductory session. Thanks uh, for the nice discussion and feedback you provided to the first um, presentation. And we are extremely happy that we can have our second keynote speaker here in person because we know by chance that he's in the Netherlands uh, these days. Um, and thank you, Simon, for, for being available for joining us here today. So Simon Witte is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and actually he's a professor for Germanic languages and literatures. Um, so uh, you might wonder why are we getting now a, a, liter a German language literature professor here? So you can see how far we go in pluralizing water. Um, but actually Simon is a, is a real example of the app. Plural approach has and many interests. So um, he is um, he's not only a professor in uh, Germanic languages, he's also a fellow at the Penn Institute for Urban Research. He is uh, in the board of the Water Center at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. He's affiliated with programs in cinema studies, environmental humanities, and gender, sexuality, and women's studies. So, very, very broad um, scope he's covering. Looking at water more specifically, his research and teaching concerns the cultural dimensions of climate change, uh, adaptation, resilience, and sustainability in general. And he's also engaged in activities that go beyond the pure academic um, or traditional academic scholarship, research, and teaching, but also involves um, yeah, more um, activism, urban design, and um, and uh, carrying uh, different projects regarding to the environment. Uh, he has a current ongoing project that looks at how Delta cities are responding to and planning for sea level rise uh, in Germany, in the Netherlands, but also in the US and in Indonesia. And the project very much focuses on Dutch responses to sea level rise, but how they are taken up in different um, countries and in an intercultural context. So that um, uh, links also again to questions of uh, colonial and post-coloniality, because many of the places he's looking at um, share this past. In uh, this year, actually, he also started a project on uh, YouTube, Project Poltergeist, uh, with a um, YouTube, um, yeah, very new forms of storytelling and creative ideas around water and um, making animated videos. And we will also learn about this uh, in the in the next uh, forty five minutes to one hour that we can spend with him. Simon, welcome to my speech. All right, so it's incredibly thrilling for me to be here. Um, so excited. I love this institution, IHE. Um, I love the fact that you are here. Um, congratulations for being here, uh, for making this a part of your life journey um, to come here. Um, I call my talk uh, Room for Ambivalence. Um, you just heard a brilliant talk by Amit. Fantastic questions and comments. And I'm going to guess that you might agree with me that there's a lot of ambivalence in the room. Um, there's a lot of ambivalence in being here in Delft, and being here in the Netherlands, being here in Europe, and being in the midst of a climate emergency, uh, as we are, uh, in reading the IPCC report uh, that came out in August. Uh, there's loads and loads of ambivalence. Um, Usually people are very uncomfortable with being ambivalent. It's not a, really a great place to be. You'd much rather be in a certain place um, and know. But I think that we need to make room for ambivalence. Uh, we need to acknowledge that it's there. We need to do something with our ambivalence. Now, the way I approach things is um, through humor. I think it's, humor is a great way to approach difficult controversial, uncomfortable things. Um, if you do it in a, let's say, in a, um, in a respectful way, humorous, in a respectful way, in a caring way, a way that cares for the other person as well, not to harm or to hurt, but actually to help and to heal and to get beyond something, that's what I think humor can do. And that's sort of what I try to do uh, as well. 
Um, I've really enjoyed listening and lear to Amit and learning from Amit. Uh, we had some co a conversation a week ago or so uh, in preparation for this, and it seemed to me that we would make a great tag team. Um, I think there are things that he can say and did say that I can't say. Um, and I'm so glad that he said it and that you responded to it. There are things that I can say um, and I think actually that's exactly what I do. What I want to do. I've called the subtitle of this a practical guide to managing your relationship with the judge. You all are here for 18 months or so. In the midst of the Netherlands, um, there are Dutch people around you. You're going to interact with them in all kinds of ways. Um, of course, you're here because the Dutch do have a lot to teach to give. Uh, uh, with regard to water in all kinds of ways. There's so much that you can learn from them. Um, I just think I'll just get started here. Um, I say it a lot, actually. The Dutch are amazing, right? I mean, there's something that's pretty amazing about the things that they've done. Um, let's just look at some of their greatest hits. There's the Afsar Dijk, uh, that 32-kilometer long dike that closed off, or dam that closed off the Zuiderzee, the Zuiderzee, right, from uh, the North Sea and transformed a body of salt water into a body of fresh water over time, bringing all kinds of environmental issues and, and destroying fisheries and ways of life and blah, 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 all of those things too, but it was quite an accomplishment. Um, the Eastern Shelf Storm Surge Barrier, no, no, you haven't checked, probably not, but you will probably have a chance to see this. I've been there many times, actually, and I could start crying as I think about being there right now. This piece of engineering moves me to tears. It's crazy. I cannot explain why a professor of literature is moved to tears by being there, but I am. I see this thing, and I just am astonished by it. There's a really interesting story that goes along with this. Dutch love to tell their water story. The story is more complicated than <laughs> it seems, um, but... There, there was an idea here that I think was important at the moment that this was completed. 1986 is when it was completed. It protects so many people. That's, I think, what really moves me. So I see that and I realize how many people it protects. There's the Maslon Storm Surge Barrier. I cry when I see this one too. This one's closer by. You'll see this probably sooner. This is in Rotterdam. And that's also just an astonishing storm surge barrier. Uh, uh, just extraordinary to see. They close it once a year for uh, 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 to test it out. I think is it when it, do they do that? It, I think maybe it just was or it's coming. At any rate, yeah. It, it may, if you have a chance to see it, that might be something. I think it should be a much bigger celebration. Um, then there's room for the river. Um, which is in Nijmegen, nearby, uh, not nearby, a ways away, and at various points along these rivers that course through the southern part of the country. Um, now you know where I got my title from, right? Room for ambivalence, room for the river. Um, I'm using that same kind of hydrological thinking for dealing with our ambivalence about the Dutch. Um, then, of course, there's Deltaris uh, right nearby doing absolutely amazing work in all kinds of fields. Um, and they have this re incredible uh, research facility. Um, they're floating, right? There's There are floating neighborhoods around. There's This one is called Schoonskip. It's in Amsterdam. It is, they claim, the most sustainable floating neighborhood within Europe. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, it has a circular economy. It uses renewable energy. They share. They do all kinds of interesting things. You might want to see it. Um, and uh, so that's one of their experiments is with floating. Then they're also doing experiments in floating on a much larger scale, anticipating possibly that this might be uh, a solution, one part, one component of adapting to higher sea levels. Um, this is at the Maritime Research Institute of the Netherlands in Wageningen. Uh, and uh, this is together with Blue 21, which is based uh, in Delft. Um, maybe you'll get a chance to meet Rutger. He's a really, really great guy. Um, and uh, he has so many amazing ideas about floating. Not just floating neighborhoods or floating architecture. Um, 
in this case, a floating energy complex with renewable energy, uh, wind and solar and so on. But uh, he can imagine floating city annexes, for instance, uh, and so on. At any rate, when, <coughs> if, let's suppose, the Dutch, if you tell the Dutch, the Dutch tell themselves this and they tell everyone, they are amazing, they'll tell you that. And something that goes along with that is that there's a chance, and it's a pretty high chance, that a certain kind of arrogance goes along with that, right? If U21, which is based uh, in Delft, uh, maybe you'll get a chance to meet Lutzker. He's a really, really great guy. Um, and uh, he has so many amazing ideas about floating, not just floating neighborhoods or floating architecture. Um, in this case, a floating energy complex with renewable energy, uh, wind and solar and so on. But uh, he can imagine floating city annexes, for instance, uh, and so on. At any rate, when, <coughs> if, let's suppose, the Dutch, if you tell the Dutch, the Dutch tell themselves this and they tell everyone, they are amazing, they'll tell you that. And something that goes along with that is that there's a chance, and it's a pretty high chance, that a certain kind of arrogance goes along with that, right? If you tell everybody you're amazing and everybody tells you back that you're amazing, you start to think that you're the one who should be doing the speaking and everybody should be doing the listening. Everybody else should be doing the listening, right? There's a kind of arrogance that sets in. And then though there are ways that they kind of modulate that arrogance. They might say things like, oh, even in the Netherlands, we have that problem. But even in saying it in that way, you know that that comes from a position of arrogance, right? It's like you're describing a problem, an issue, something you're dealing with, and they say, aha, even in the Netherlands, we have to deal with that. But we have a solution for it. Okay, so I call that polar arrogance. And I think you're going to encounter it in one form or another. It's good to know that it's there because you can use humor and other ways as well to not exactly to combat it, but to deal with it. Maybe to disarm it, maybe to get around it. Maybe, in fact, as you can see from point six, maybe you'll be able to help them become uh, acquire a kind of polar humility which I think would be a really, really good thing, right? So that's what we're sort of aiming for. Okay, so what I want to do today with you is just run through a few things that the Dutch don't want you to know. Um, and so that, and I think that that's going to help you in, in develop a kind, a sort of a, a position. It's not an attitude. It's really a position from which to confront, deal with, polar arrogance. If it presents itself, you'll be able to confront it, encounter it on this basis. So these are things the Dutch don't want you to know. <laughs> okay, the first one is the M word. Anyone have a guess as to what the M word is? Money. No. <laughs> yeah, it's a word. It is an M word, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but in Dutch, it would be the G word then, right? It'd be helt. But it's the M word. Me, me, me. Me? Me, me. Me. Oh, egoism. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm, maybe. Yeah, meat too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm thinking mitigation. Mitigation. I, just, I think of everything I do, I start from the climate emergency, right? Everything. Uh, but, probably, but most everything, I start there. And mitigation, we usually pair up with or opposed to a fair adaptation, right? And you know, there's an ongoing back and forth about mitigation, adaptation, et cetera, how they, and you probably have figured out where you are on that. The Dutch don't, I generalize a lot here, and, and you know I shouldn't do that. I know I shouldn't do that. I should be, every time I say the Dutch, you should hear many Dutch people. Okay, not the uh, Dutch, but many Dutch people. Okay, so many Dutch people don't like to hear the word mitigate, right? Because mitigation means reducing carbon emissions. And uh, the Dutch say, <laughs> basically, um, we, we don't want to mitigate, we want to adapt. And we want to sell our adaptation technology to all of you all so that we can make more of the other and word money. Uh, we'll get to that. Okay, so this is what they don't want you to know. 
This is share of renewable energy. Look where they are. They're at the bottom. You know, take a good look at the Dutch economy, what it runs on. Fossil fuels are absolutely crucial to this economy in so many ways. And the renewables are not ramping up. Who creates Dutch energy policy? Is it the government? No. It is, in fact, Orgenda. You heard of Orgenda, Orgenda? The Dutch climate case? Sounds like the Dutch. Oh, yeah, we have a climate case. Uh, no. <laughs> This was an organization that sued the Dutch government for not being ambitious enough uh, in its energy policy and reducing uh, carbon emissions. And they won, and it surprised the whole world. And then what did the Dutch government do? They appealed. <laughs> they didn't say, oh yeah, okay, we'll take care of it. No, they said, no, they appealed. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court just quite recently. And the Supreme Court lectured the Dutch government and said, you have to do this. It's in the Constitution. Principle of care. Look at this. Dutch energy policy comes from a small group that sues the government and a very brilliant lawyer. He's right here. You can hardly see him. Roger Cox, brilliant guy. Marianne Minisma, right here. Brilliant woman. Amazing. She's the really the motor of this. Fantastic. I walked with her two days ago from Gouda to Rotterdam on the climate miles for Urgenda. For um, she's brilliant. But look at two. Dutch energy policy. Donate now. <laughs> we have to donate in order to press the Dutch government to do something about this. Okay. There's Shell, same lawyer, different group, Roger Cox, Milieu Defensi, Friends of the Earth. They sued Shell, wrote that Shell, and the, lawyer, the judges found in their favor as well. Shell has changed some things. They sold off some assets that, yeah, in the U.S., um, and, uh, but they're appealing as well, right? So... Uh, Dutch energy policy is driven by lawsuits by a very small group. You would think, maybe, that Dutch, many Dutch people um, think that Urgenda is great and love Urgenda. You would be wrong. <laughs> you don't like them. Um, um, and here's sort of my room. Okay, this really, really gets me. I, I understand it, but I really don't understand it. The Netherlands was created with windmills. We all know that, right? The windmills pumped the water up and out and dried out the boulders and blah, blah. And you, you would think that a country that owes its existence to windmills would embrace new windmills, windmills 2.0. They hate, many Dutch people, hate those windmills, and they do not want them. And, and you know, that's funny, but... It makes me really, really angry. I do not understand it for a minute. I really do not. This is serious. We're in a climate emergency, and the Dutch are saying, not a windmill in, I don't want to see it. I don't want to travel through the Netherlands and see a windmill. I don't, I don't want to be on the beach and see a windmill. I just don't want any windmills. And they will come up with, all right. Anyway, all right. <laughs> all right. This has actually led to the formation, not this alone, but you, I know Dutch politics, long story, there's so many parties, and they keep on forming new parties. This is a new party. It's called Yes 21. And I'm going to give you a little translation here. So this is their climate and environmental policy. The first one down the bottom is, we invest and focus totally on climate adaptation. As I was saying, climate adaptation only. Um, and we forget about all that other stuff. Uh, we disconnect climate and energy from each other. Let energy do its whatever the fossil fuel industry wants to do. And climate, you know, that's something else. We don't make that connection. And finally, <laughs> do this in Dutch, you'll get it. Stoppen met wind turbines op land en zijs. Zonneweiden en biomassa. Just 
stop renewables. That's their position. Stop renewables. Sometimes I think that Yah 21 says out loud what some in the larger party, the uh, FBDD, uh, think. So that's, that's a dirty secret, right? It's internal, maybe not so external. Uh, this is not what the Dutch are projecting when they go to Glasgow, believe me, or when they're at the World Exposition in Dubai right now, where they, are, in fact, are celebrating Dutch sustainability. I don't see it, but all right. Okay, next, sea level rise optimism. This, um, this is an interesting phenomenon. Um, so the Dutch read, or many Dutch read, no, many Dutch, who reads the IPCC reports? Some people read the IPCC reports, they hear about it. At any rate, for the most part, there is a, a, a kind of culture of sea level rise optimism here. No way of putting it would be to say downplaying it. Uh, it's not going to be so bad. 85 centimeters by the end of the century. No. So the best case scenario is what folks assume generally. And it's not just folks, but that actually translates up into government, into policy. And it's not just here in the Netherlands, because when the Netherlands takes its policy and its technology to other places, it takes that sea level rise optimism with it. I'm not sure that that's always a good, no, I'm not sure it's not a good thing. It shouldn't, it shouldn't do that. There are great Dutch climate scientists, oceanographers, etc. They work at Delta Iris, they work at NEOPS, they work in Utrecht, in Wageningen, at Delft, etc. They're, they're at IT. They know, and they are looking for all kinds of ways to let people know, let government know, to move government to do what needs to be done. But, so you've got folks, you know, uh, who are scientists, who are saying, we should be look, listening to what the IPC is saying, and other scientists are saying, in fact, we're writing for the, with the IPCC, many uh, folks I know do write for the IPCC, um, and the government is thinking, okay, we're gonna get, let's massage these numbers, let's find a, a nice middle ground somewhere, we'll call it, you know, 1.0. Or maybe 1.3. We'll give you 1.3, but we're not going a centimeter higher than that. Now, this is a problem for the Netherlands because the Netherlands is very, very vulnerable. 60% uh, of the Netherlands is not below sea level, but in total, 60% of the Netherlands is vulnerable to catastrophic flooding. And it could happen if there were a perfect storm. It could happen much sooner than many think. Uh, it has to be a perfect storm, but climate change is, of course, increasing the likelihood of that, the odds. That one in 10,000 year storm could happen in the next five years, right? That's the kind of thing we're facing. And the outlook for what lies ahead is different, is very different. This is from the IPCC. Oh, goodness, did it get cut No, it didn't. Okay, I'm just going to read. So, according to the new assessment, global, I'm at the top there, global mean sea level rise above the likely range, 2 meters by 2100 and 5 meters by 2150, under a very high greenhouse gas emission scenario, it's the highest, low confidence that it will happen. But this is the important thing cannot be ruled out due to deep uncertainty in ice sheet processes. Antarctica is in the rear view mirror of the Netherlands. And lots of scientists in the Netherlands as well as elsewhere are watching Antarctica as closely as they can, trying to understand because Antarctica's behavior is scary. And that makes the, because of that uncertainty, that makes the Netherlands extremely vulnerable, but it's really, really difficult. Because the Dutch want to, oh no, I'm not gonna say it right now, it'll come. Okay, okay, anyway, so that's sea level rise optimism. Water, friend or foe. The Dutch water story says, 
we have been waging war against water for centuries. How many of you have heard that, that line before? You haven't spoken to too many Dutch people yet. When you do, they'll tell you, we've been waging war against water for, for centuries. And that's why we are what we are. Um, but for around 50 years, if not longer, a different attitude or approach towards thinking about water and our relationship to water has been around, to regard water as a friend, to think that it's important to live with water, frankly, to return to a kind of local knowledge that is actually a Dutch local knowledge. It, it, you lived on mounds. You didn't live down below sea level. You didn't pump water out so that your land subsided. You lived sensibly, you know, the kind of thing that Ahmed was talking about. Um, so that story is out there. Um, this is, uh, these are four scenarios for the Netherlands for the future that come from Del Tires. And I wanted to look at them with you briefly. Um, they are protect close, protect open, sea words or advance, nebewegen, difficult to translate. It corresponds to accommodate, adapt. Accommodate, accommodate water. And this is amazing uh, that because this was one of those things that came from Del Taris to kind of shake up the government, shake up people, and say, we've got to be thinking about this. We have some important decisions to make now that concern what the country is going to look like. Are we going to build a fortress and pump out the rivers, pump out the Rhine, pump out the Ma, uh, the ma, the mass, the moors, and so on. Are we going to do that? Are we going to pump fr out from the Eiselmere, from the yeah, from the Eiselmere, or are we going to leave the rivers open as we do now, and just kind of continue to subside and subside and let the rivers rise and rise go up higher? And it, both of those pictures are like that's nuts, right? That would be crazy to do that. The third one, save arts, that's advanced. This one is, is interesting because many, many Dutch people like this picture. It's like, yeah, that's like, you know, a uh, war against water, Star Wars edition. Uh, you know, this is like, wow, I'll show you some of the ideas. Maybe though, that's the one where water is a, is a, is a friend. It's a friend that wants its, debt back, once it's land back. And it requires retreat. And it requires all kinds of interesting adaptations, involve floating, for instance, and other sorts of things. It's a challenge. It doesn't have to happen like this, but it, sh it could start to happen. You could start to think about the process. Okay, so advance. Here's one. This idea is out there. It's called the Hacks and Um You build islands in front of the coast and you close the coast off and you so you maintain uh, an artificial water level basically what we have right now which is nap you've probably heard of that right which is a round sea level we would maintain that and the oceans would rise and this would become fresh water etc that one's out there Eco ecological damage of course this is a huge huge uh, thing. How did that change? Okay, it's where I wanted to go anyway. This one is utterly crazy and it's really, really interesting. I don't know if you saw this one in the news or not. It's called the Northern European Enclosure Dam. And, and you can tell by the acronym that the guy who invented this, uh, is a joker. I, I was on a podcast with him yesterday. His name is George Huskamp. And it, it spells need, right? Any of you read uh, The Lorax by Dr. Zeus? Yes. You remember, everybody needs a sneeze, right? And, and, and many Dutch might wind up thinking everybody needs a need, just like this. This would involve building a dam from the northwest corner of France to the southeast corner of England, and from Scotland across the Shetland Islands all the way up to Norway, and letting the seas rise while maintaining that artificial level for all of Western Europe. 
Well, it would be very interesting in English to think about that. It talk about fortress thinking, right? It's amazing. Now, Schwartz did not, does not want this to happen. What he was doing is something that I compare to Jonathan Swift's modest proposal. Jonathan Swift's modest proposal was, you know, we've got this food shortage and we've got this abundance of babies. And, you know, we could consider, like, um, eating babies. <laughs> you know, it's like, through its exaggeration, it calls attention to the problem. And Schwartz was trying to do the same thing. He was saying, we, you know, we could mitigate, use the M word, or we could build need. It would be much better to mitigate than this. Unfortunately, many Dutch think this is a good idea. All right. All right. This is plan B. Um, so this is a, a designer's vision of what the Netherlands could look like. You could get into much more detail here. I'd encourage you to do so. You can go to his website. Um, it was really, really interesting. It does involve um, retreat, moving, moving from the West to East. This is a big deal right now because the Dutch want to build uh, a million new homes in 10 years. And most of them will be built below sea level or in vulnerable areas along the rivers because that's where people want to live. And how are you going to tell people, no, you can't do that? And how are you going to tell developers, no, you can't build there? Okay, next, savior complex. Now we're going to go abroad. The Dutch, many Dutch, no, this is actually, this is Dutch governmental policy. The Dutch government wants you to think you need them and that they can save you. Uh, this was at a Tour de France, uh, the, uh, a few, uh, maybe five years ago or more, six years ago, seven years ago. Um, you know, this was at the Eastern Shelf Storm Surge Barrier. One leg of the Tour de France, I think it was the Tour de France, right, finished there. And this is what everybody saw. What are you thinking? That's supposed to be funny. <laughs> what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Um, Bring in the Dutch, right? And that kind of messaging, I have a feeling you probably have heard it. It's come across your uh, your radars, your screens, etc. Um, that's there, right? We can save you. Um, this, by the way, was a slide at a dissertation defense by Ellen uh, Minkman, who wrote a really, really great dissertation about the Great Garuda. The, the seawall, the NCICD in Jakarta, about that project, which we'll I'll talk about briefly in just a moment. Um, yeah. Okay, so the inside version of this is what the Dutch call, the Dutch government calls, the international water ambition. This is their policy. Um, what does it entail? It, it shifts from rebuilding to preventing. Yeah, I'm sure that you all can, can, can agree with that. That's really important, right? To prevent disaster rather than, and invest in prevention rather than invest in rebuilding in vulnerable areas. Improve water governance, increase the role of water diplomacy, improve the situation of vulnerable groups, also in developing countries. I like to think of those three middle categories as the kind of thing, not that the government does, but what IHE does. Basically, right? I think the Dutch government has outsourced the three middle <laughs> items of the international water ambition to IHE. That's what it seems like to me. And then that fifth one, increase the profitability of the Dutch water sector, right? The Dutch want to make a buck um, with their water technology and therefore convincing you that uh, they can save you and your country, you know, that helps them a lot with that. Okay, polar humility. This is not a virtue of the Dutch, but I think that all of us have an opportunity to help Dutch people with whom we interact begin to learn polar humility. Um, I have some examples here. Um, humility and humiliation are not obviously not the same thing. Humiliation, though, is something that, that can occasionally happen. 
And these next two slides don't concern humility so much as humiliation. Humiliation is what happens when arrogance, you know, just, just persists. And then something happens that is humiliating. Humility avoids that. Uh, at least, yeah, I would say so. Avoids that. So this is the NCICD, the National Capital Investment Coastal Development, or Great Guru to Seawall Project. It, it, it's not coming to be, certainly not in this form. It was a megalomaniac project. It was a Dutch project working with uh, the uh, in, uh, with the uh, Indonesian government, with the, uh, uh, with, the uh, with Jakarta as well. It's a very complicated story. I can't go into it right now, but it's an extremely Dutch solution. If you look at it, you might say, "Hey, doesn't that look like the Haxis Ede?" Right? Same thing. Islands. Uh, this is supposed to protect Jakarta. 40% of Jakarta is essentially polders, just like in the Netherlands. It's under, it's below sea level. It's very similar. Um, and um, this would create a freshwater basin, two of them, huge freshwater basins, and protect um, Jakarta from sea level rise and from storm surge and so on. Extremely controversial, lots of interesting things to read about it. I can't go into that right now. But take a look at this. <laughs> this is the tulip. This is the tulip in front of the Dutch coast. Now you might think this is just a joke, right? Um, Word so. Um, in 2008, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, whose name was Balkan Enda, he thought it would be a great idea <laughs> to protect the Dutch coast with a, a tulip island. Uh, and so he proposed this. And, you know, serious people at the Delta Commission, this is the time of the second Delta Commission, they had to work very, very hard behind the scenes to persuade uh, the Prime Minister that this was not a good idea. Um, this is a little bit humiliating too, I think. Um, humility is something else, and this is really where I, I believe we, as non-Dutch, have an opportunity to help those Dutch people we encounter who are plagued or afflicted with polder arrogance to learn a bit of polder humility. Polder arrogance stands in the way of two bilateral, multilateral cooperation and is so important. You heard Amit. He's so right. You, have, you bring so much to the table, not just what you know, but also your perspective on things, the kinds of questions that you ask. All of those things are important. And if Dutch arrogance doesn't even let you get to say any of that, then where is that going to go? Now, this is just one IHE example here. This is at the bottom there, that's Shanur Hassan, who uh, defended her dissertation, I think about a year ago or so. Um, she was a student of Marquez and Ya in the water governance um, section. And she called it, as you can see, making waves, reimagining post, uh, policy transfer in the context of development cooperation. And uh, it's a really brilliant dissertation. There are single articles that were published that you also can read. But she, I think, ideally represents that kind of critical but productive, constructive perspective that kind of, you know, uh, there was a lot of pushback. She really encountered pushback from the Dutch water sector when, when she presented and she talked to them, but she persisted. And I think people have been coming around. She's been invited to be a guest, even, even, <laughs> even with Hank Ofink. So she, I mean, how many of you know Hank, who Hank Ofink is? It's just an endless Whoa. That's not many. He is, that's right, five, six. Okay, so he is the Royal Dutch Internet, no, Royal Dutch Special Envoy for International Water Affairs. 
He's Mr. Water. He's the Sherpa, water Sherpa to the United Nations. He's a really, really great guy. He is not polar arrogant. He's in a difficult position because the position actually requires him to be polar arrogant, but he's not. But it's very interesting. He's a, he, I don't know how he does this, but it's very interesting. But at any rate, Shanur uh, uh, sat at a table, I think it was on TV, I'm not sure, it might have been radio, but she sat at a table with Hank, and there was a pretty interesting discussion that went on there. You will have those opportunities too. I want to say something about scale. <laughs> I'm a professor of German, what, what am I doing up here, right? You have no idea what will happen once you start talking, once you tell people what you think, once you look around and see, what leverage do I have? What can I change? Um, because it's you, you do it, and then suddenly you've got more leverage and more influence. You do that, and you have more and more. It's really crazy. It's a little bit, I don't know, it's for, I, I'm not a surfer, so I actually don't know, but it's, it's something like that. It's like you are on water, and it's the, it's the force, it's a, a force that's underneath you that you begin to ride. You can do that. It's really amazing. So I encourage you, you know, it'll seem like starting small, I certainly did. Um, but if you do start, it will just begin to compound and you, be, you will become a person of influence. There's just no doubt in my mind that you will become a person of influence if you do it and you do it for the right reasons. And you do it out of a humility, not out of arrogance, but because you want something good. And you want something good for others. That will happen. You'll make waves. All right. And right, now we come to Boulder Guys. I have no idea what I'm doing on time, but at any rate, um, I want to show you one of my first gifts to the Netherlands. It's this animation. I created a persona whose name is Poltergeist. You might have heard of Poltergeist. I think there's like films with Poltergeist. A Poltergeist is a German word, and it's it's a, basically a ghostly troublemaker, right? A ghost is a troublemaker. And Poltergeist my mind, is also a troublemaker, but he's the troublemaker of the boulders. And in another sense, it's like that part of, uh, um, of Dutch culture that the Dutch don't want to confront, don't want to face, don't want to deal with. They repress it. They, you know, it's, it's down below. But that polder guy keeps coming up just like water uh, and haunts them. Uh, and so on. Anyway, I created this persona, Professor Poldergeist, and Professor Poldergeist speaks to Dutch people and other people like you as well. And I'd like to share that with you. It's a five minute video that I created with uh, three of my students. I think I should be able just to play this. And, uh, okay. Oh, I've got it going so many times now. Welcome to Project. Can you get me that one? Uh oh. Do these cookies with the sign in? No. Okay, you'll help me, right? Poltergeist, an ongoing series of animated videos that plumb the complexities of life below sea level. I'm Poltergeist, and I'll be your host as we peer beneath the surface in the Netherlands and other coastal regions. Because when it comes to water in the Dutch, there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. The Dutch are amazing. They have a powerful story about living with water, and they're not afraid to let people know it. We've been waging war against water for centuries. We have water in our DNA. God created the world, but the Dutch created the Netherlands. <laughs> Their storm surge barriers are legendary. Each one of those arms is as big as the Eiffel Tower. 
While coastal cities like Miami and Jakarta worry about sea level rise, the Dutch say, relax. We've been living below sea level forever. We've got you covered, and that's very reassuring. But how does it work? Parts of the Netherlands are like a big old empty swimming pool with a shallow end and a deep end. At the shallow end, water comes in from some major rivers. We're talking major. Ever hear of the Rhine? But here's the thing. They don't fill the pool. Instead, the Dutch pull them through to the sea, leaving residents below. Along the coast, the deep end butts up against the North Sea. So there are dikes and dunes that keep the water out, and those barriers on the rivers in case of storm surge. And there's rain from above, land that subsides, and a water table that wants to rise from below, and a population that wants to keep its feet dry. That's where the pumps come in. They lift the water that collects below up into those rivers above that then drain into the sea. It takes a lot of ingenuity and energy to keep that big old swimming pool drained. Okay, now we understand how it works. But just how big is the Dutch swimming pool? I've often heard that 50% of the Netherlands is below sea level. That seems like a good number, half the country. But I wanted to be sure, so I did a little research. The NAB Foundation says that half of the Netherlands consists of boulders that are below sea level. NAP is the name of that blue and white measuring rod that you see poking up out of canals and rivers all over the country. They ought to know, right? But I started to run into numbers that were even higher. In the 2007 IPCC report, it says 55% of the Netherlands is below sea level. But it doesn't stop there. The Consul General of the Netherlands in Miami, one of those coastal cities the Dutch want to save, was interviewed on national public radio. And get this, she said 80% of the country is below sea level. But it's really almost our whole country. I couldn't believe my ears. 80%? No, wait, really, almost the whole country. How is that even possible? Is the whole country like a drain swimming pool? Well, someone challenged the IPCC on their claim of 55%. And the IPCC said, okay, we'll look into it. And they located their source. Guess what? It was the Dutch government, their own environmental assessment agency. Oops. So how big is the Dutch swimming pool really? It's 26% of the country. That's it. Still a lot but not half or three quarters or almost the whole country. So I have a question. How can a nation known for the precision of its water defense system come up with such crazy exaggerations? To find an answer, we're gonna to have to peer beneath the surface. Let's invite the Netherlands to lie down on Dr. Poltergeist's couch. Come here, take a load off. Now, in my opinion, these involuntary exaggerations of yours are symptoms. They're symptoms that emerge from the Dutch collective unconscious. What's the unconscious trying to tell us? I have two theories. Theory one, this is a display of bravado coupled with salesmanship. We're invincible. Why should we worry about sea level rise? The whole country's already below sea level. And by the way, could we interest you in a storm surge bear? <laughs> theory two, anxiety. Sheer panic. Oh my god, the whole country is below sea level and sea level rise is accelerating. We're going to drown in our own swimming pool. What are we going to do? I think both theories are right at one and the same time. Two sides of the same gilder. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, the Dutch really are amazing. And we're going to need their adaptive ingenuity more than ever. But that means being honest about the climate emergency. After 2050, it may not be possible to keep the swimming pool drained, no matter how big it is. Accelerated sea level rise takes a whole new level of courage. Can the Dutch do what it takes? We'll be watching. I'm Poltergeist. You know where to find me. I'll be right here, peering beneath the surface. Because when it comes to water in the Dutch, there's more going on than meets the eye. All right.
Thank you, thank you very much. That, that's the first time I've done a public sh uh, screening of this. I just wanted to show you this though. Um, the special thanks part. Oh, two other things. I made sure there were uh, Dutch subtitles, and my little niece did that, Josephine. Uh, and I also wanted to be sure there were Indonesian subtitles. Uh, and so a friend of mine from Samaram, Dian, uh, she did the Indonesian subtitles. Um, if any of you were to say, wow, I'd really love to have that with subtitles, let me know. We can arrange for that. Um, then I also want to show, I needed credibility, right? Because it's like, who is this guy? He's a professor of German. And believe me, I've been challenged that way. Um, and I did, because we consulted with all of these people. Um, Matthijs Bau is an architect and designer. Lika Brackel is a philosopher, uh, but she looks specifically at issues that come up around managed retreat. Um, and Marjolein Hasnot was the person who came up with those four Del Tires for, uh, scenarios. Uh, she works at Del Tires. Um, Martin Kleinhans is an absolutely amazing river hydrologist at the University of Utrecht. Patrick Naderkorn is a comedian, but uh, he and I work on projects uh, relating to communicating issues with sea level rise to the Dutch. And Hank Niebuhr is uh, someone who works uh, very much in, with um, uh, uh, building with nature. Um, Eco Design is his company, but he's worked in many places around the world. Um, that lends a little bit of credibility because all of them agreed to have their names appear here because they had talked to us about this and they said, yes, I can stand behind this. So that was my gesture, my first gesture, uh, to a gift to the Netherlands to help, you know, bring about a little bit more polder humility. Um, I hope that you will also, I'm sure you will also find ways to do that as well. Humor isn't the only way to do it. I think authenticity is also a really fabulous way to do it. Just be a person, be yourself. Let people know what you think, how you feel, and so on. That also matters. That's also effective. But humor is pretty good, too. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks uh, so much, Simon, for this uh, inspiring and entertaining uh, lecture. And for the many ideas I am sure it brought to our students also about Maybe what will you tackle in your first uh, essay and assignments uh, in your courses? Uh, we're pretty advanced in time, but I want to give you the chance also to ask questions. Yeah. Who wants to start? Hello. Hi. Um, my question is with regards to the numbers you gave. Um, how much of the Netherlands is below sea level? Yeah. So at the end you said it's twenty six percent. Yeah. Right. So I wanted to know how you came up with that number. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> you're right. Um, that number was the number that uh, the Dutch government came up with, the uh, Environmental Assessment Agency, after they had been challenged by the IPCC. So, um, that would have been sort of the best, um, uh, let's say, uh, measurement that was possible around 2010 or something like that. Um, probably, uh, the, um, technology, the use of satellites and so on to do that, the calculations that are made, they probably have improved in the meantime. Um, and in the meantime, of course, too, there has been some sea level rise, though, along the Dutch coast, for other reasons, uh, you know, there has been not much noticeable, uh, sea level rise yet. Um, is... I guess that's one part of the answer to that. The second part, though, is that the vulnerability is not just what's below sea level. It's also, should there be a storm surge, should it breach the dikes? Of course, 
a storm surge is above sea level, right? Tide is above sea level. And a storm surge is even more above that. Um, so that's one additional vulnerability. And then another is the rivers themselves. Uh, so there are many areas along the rivers. If, you, if, if I were to go back to that one map, you would see that along the rivers, where the rivers are above human habitation, if those exceed their capacity, if there isn't room for the river, then flooding takes place. Um, so I think technically there's an agreement that 60% of the Netherlands is currently vulnerable. But I heard Peter Schloss, who is the Delta Commissioner, so he's the person in, who is at the highest level in charge of uh, water security in the Netherlands. He said, after the flooding that took place in uh, Western Germany and in Limburg and in Belgium, he said, frankly, 100% of the Netherlands is vulnerable. Uh, my question is, as Netherlands continues to expand uh, within the sea, and not only in Europe and it's also in the Southeast Asia, it will directly impact the the rising of sea level in the many coastal regions around the world. So is there any restrictions currently set on Netherlands on how much uh, area they can uh, expand? And also about your retreat, because some of the major cities lie in the under uh, swimming pool area, as you said. So uh, what plans do they have for the cities if that's the case? <laughs> No one's got a plan that's adequate for what's coming. Um, yeah, that, I, I, I think you probably know this. Um, I had the pleasure and, and honor of, of uh, being involved in something with Schurt Huskamp, uh, who is an oceanographer, and I frequently interact with uh, Marjolein Hasnot, and I know other climate scientists as well. Um, they live with a burden, right? They live with a burden about what they know, and and even more that they're, despite the fact that that some of them do their utmost to communicate it, people are not listening. Are not listening. Re they're not really listening. Um, so the scenarios, the IPCC scenarios. I mean, you know, it, it, it comes across in in in, um, in numbers. So it will affect 200 million people. It will affect 900 million people. 900 million people will be below sea level. Will uh, be in danger of catastrophic flooding. 900 million, people, one billion people. It's it's incalculable, right? And solutions like seawalls. It's not the solution. It's not going to work. It's also it's not happening overnight, right? It's it's definitely happening on a much you know on a it's ridiculous. These are processes that should happen over hundreds of thousands and millions of years, and they're happening in lifetimes. That's that's facts. But it's not like it happens overnight, and so um, it is important, not just for the Netherlands, obviously but for many countries, coastal areas, to be thinking about this. Now I want to bring in someone by the name of Salim Hook, who is from Bangladesh. Uh, I don't know if you are, any of you follow him on Twitter, but he talks about, he, he will be in Glasgow, and he will talk, and he talks all the time, and very loudly and eloquently, about loss and damage. You've heard of loss and damage. Loss and damage. That has to do with the debt, frankly, that industrial Western countries owe for their carbon to countries who have contributed very little carbon and who are extremely vulnerable. They should pay a lot of money, loss and damage, loss of land, loss of resources, damage, etc., so that these countries can adapt, 
find solutions and so on. They are, nobody is adequately equipped, but as you can tell with COVID, right? In the United States, they're administering booster shots now, third shots. And as you know, uh, in other places in the world, it's like 2%, 10% are vaccinated. Um, and that does not bode well for how um, adaptation is going to happen, how adaptation will be funded uh, in the future. I don't know if that's I answered your question, but that's how I would respond to it. Western, I am Mohamed Sam Koruma from Nigeria. Okay, my question has to do with um, during the presentation, something I didn't quite actually is, I don't know if it was highlighted, is the depth at which the Netherlands is at below sea level. And um, the follow up question could be is the debt consistent in the entire Delft or at certain points based on topography? Yeah, um, uh, it, it's, I didn't say it explicitly, and the video doesn't mention it, but it shows it. If you look at the swimming pool, you'll see that the deep end is 6.76 meters. And that is, and this is also going to be not quite precise, because there's always subsidence going on, but that is the lowest point. So the lowest point in the Netherlands officially is 6.76 meters. That's very deep, isn't it? When you think about that. Now, of course, and that's sort of, the swimming pool is a metaphor. The empty swimming pool is a metaphor, but it's a pretty good one. Has a shallow end and has a deep end. Um, there, you know, it, it, it isn't all focused in one area, but there is a kind of focus. There are parts of the Netherlands, obviously, that are not uh, below sea level. Uh, they happen to be mostly in the east and in the south. Um, and so there are, you know, you, there's actually, it, it might be interesting for you to get that. There's an app that you can get, and then you enter your zip code, and it will tell you exactly how far below sea level you are at that point. I'm sure that uh, Jennifer and uh, Michelle can tell you what that app is. Um, so that, I hope it's in English. I think it probably also is in English, too. Um, so that, that you can you can move around the country and you can take your measurements and see uh, what's going on. Are you here? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. This is the director from Bangladesh. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, questions about the energy of the main energy source in the Netherlands and also in a mitigation aspects. What is the per capita emissions in Netherlands? What is the per capita carbon dioxide emissions in Netherlands? Uh, this might be a technical term that I don't quite know. Say, say one more time. Per capita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great question. Um, so I have that on the slide somewhere, but off the top of my head, I can't say so. I can say sort of, I did recently, I, I did a, uh, gave a talk, which also is on video, um, where I compared Jakarta and the Netherlands. Uh, because, you know, to, because there's a feeling, I think, in the Netherlands certainly, and, and I think it's widely shared, at least in, in the West, you know, that you can't imagine two places that are more opposite than Jakarta and the Netherlands. I disagree with that. I think they're actually very, very similar. But they're also dissimilar in ways, and they're dissimilar in important ways. One is, Indonesia is a huge country, right? Over 200 million people. The Netherlands, frankly, the population of the Netherlands is still not equal to the population of the larger Jakarta area, Jabalataba. Right? That's around 30 million, and the Netherlands is somewhere around 17 million. So that's one difference. But another one, of course, is GDP. And another one is carbon per capita. 
And I believe the Dutch uh, carbon per capita is about five times what it is for Indonesia. Um, I think natural gas is what uh, they rely on most for um, uh, for energy, or at least certainly for electricity generation. 